Good evening, everyone. My name is Tommy Ross. I'm the co-chairman of the Somerville Labor Coalition, along with my very good friend, Ed Halloran. Uh, just to let everybody know, we, uh, we are going to be filming tonight with uh, SCAT TV. Thank you very much, SCAT. Shout out to them. Make no doubt about it. Our way of life is under attack right now. The union movement is getting smaller and smaller. There are less unions in this country right now than there were 20 years ago. One of the reasons is the right is under attack. They want our pensions. They want our health care. They want to diminish our rights. All around us right now, in New Hampshire and in Rhode Island, you see legislation being filed for right to work. It's going to come here eventually. It's going to come from the right wing. It's going to come from the Republicans. Uh, we've had some difficult times with even our own de Democratic friends. But the right to work has been beat down from in, in the other states. But these people think that we shouldn't have the right to collectively bargain very important things. We shouldn't be able to bargain wages. We shouldn't be able to bargain over our pensions, over our health care. We shouldn't have the right to bargain over simple things for safety. But we do it because collectively we're stronger than them. And we need to be like that. And we need to educate our members. And that's what we're doing today, the democratic process. And thank you all for being part of it. Our members need to know who supports us, who's with us, and who's against us. And most importantly, when we finally do make a decision who we're going to go with, what we're going to do, we have to go to work. We have to make those people make sure they get elected, do our due diligence, knock on doors, send out emails, make phone calls, talk to our friends, talk to our families, and make damn sure the people that we are electing who espouse the same views and ideologies as our rank and file get elected. They're our voice. We can't go up to the State House. We can't go up to City Hall. They can't hear us, but collectively they can. And they can hear us with our representatives. So we better make damn sure that we elect the right one. And that's what we're doing here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Now I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing uh, a longtime friend of my father, and uh, I, I consider a friend of myself, one of the most popular and long-serving mayors in uh, this city, Mayor Gene Broom. Thank you. I want to congratulate the union officers for putting on this candidate's night. It's been fa it's fantastic. I haven't seen a crowd like this in a long time, and you should do this more often. I want to thank Ed. I want to thank Ed for being so kind to invite me to say a few words regarding the relationship between the unions and the members. The thing is that we have today the unions and, this, and the elected officials. My father was a union worker. He worked as a plasterer for the city of Somerville. When he, I don't think there was unions at that time, when he decided to retire, I think his paycheck, monthly paycheck, was $175 a month. Thank God that he was living with me and we could take care of him and my mother. That's not a lot of money to live on. But at that time, I suppose it was a lot different than what you pay for expenses today. But the thing is that we have so much that we can do together. The people who do not get involved, when it comes time for election time and people start sending them notices of they want their vote, or if they get something in the mail, a brochure, or they have their doorbell ring, they start thinking. And what they think about is that heavy tax bill they're getting, that heavy water bill they're getting, or their heavy rent charge that they're getting, and if they're getting the services to compensate for all of that. And that's where the aldermen and the unions get together. In this room today, there's probably over 100 unions people are better. I personally think, and I like to call them our goodwill ambassadors for the elected officials, because they're the ones who are going to help you get elected or re-elected. 
for what they do. But I want to talk about, I want to talk about the relationship that we have and what the aldermen should do to work with the, with the unions so that they can at least be partners in something that they both want to do. What's best for the city as far as the elected officials are concerned? And I hope that they do that. And if they shouldn't do that, they shouldn't get elected or they shouldn't get reelected. The second thing is the union workers, what's best for the city. And the, and the union workers, for what I can see, in my own theory, and I saw things, and I'll just say a couple. When the fire department, when I had the chemical spill in the early 80s, and we had six, 13,000 gallons of phosphorus trichloride going into our sewer system, not hitting our water supply, I was scared stiff. And we worked for 24 hours to try to remedy that. And we had over 500 people go to the hospital. I had to evacuate 14,000 people. And a lot of them that went to the hospital were firemen, and some never came back to work. It's things like that. And what happens with the police? When they go out and sometimes not knowing if they're going to come back home again. And look at Oliveri, Mario Oliveri, got shot five times. And look at Sean, Sean Collier, who minded his own business, but he got shot, and he's dead today. And, and I look at the DPW workers, and you see it every day. They're planting the trees, they're cleaning the city, they're planting flowers, they, they're fixing sidewalks, they do, the, they do uh, water breaks, on and on and on. And so those of you who are ambassadors, because the all of them can say, when, they, when the people say to them, well, what am I getting for city services? I'll tell you what you're getting. And you can say all of those things. And you have something good to say about each one of, of those departments, and even the departments that you don't see. The election department, and the school department, the, the, the librarians, the people who work in all the different departments in City Hall, city clerk's office, on and on and on. And she's telling me to stop. <laughs> my, my, my assistant, Grace Abruzzo, used to do that when I used to speak, and she'd go like this, and i go like this. And, she would go, and then she'd go like this. But in any case, in any case, I will stop because I know you have a long agenda. You don't want to hear me. You want to hear the candidates. But, but most of all, I want to say this. One thing my father did say to me, and I'll stop. One thing my father did say to me when I became an alderman, I know you can't do much for the city workers as an alderman, but whatever you can do, please try to help them. They're deserving of your help. And that's why when, not when, when uh, uh, health insurance went from 50% to 99%, and it almost killed me, and then they had the unions come to me and say to me, would you give it to the retirees too? As tough as we were financially, I had to do it. I had to do it because it was right to do so. And that's what I did. So I'll stop by saying that I want to congratulate all the candidates that are running, because we'd like to have new blood. I want to wish them all luck, the candidates that are running and the ones that are running for re-election. But remember one thing. It's the voters that are going to put you in there, and you can't fool the voters. Don't, think the, don't listen to the developers. Don't look and listen to the big business. They can buy your bumper stickers, and they can get your brochures, but they can't get your votes. You're going to hear a lot of things tonight about uh, development, about transparency, about uh, affordable housing, and you know, and all this kind of stuff is important. But as municipal workers, I just want to remind all of us of what's happened in this past administration over the 10 years. We had one of the lowest paid DPW departments in the entire state compared to the other, other cities and towns. Had to go seven years almost seven years without a contract. The police office is doing one of the most dangerous jobs that anybody, over five years without a contract. The police officers, the firefighters, another four years. We can't sign contracts fairly. They're not negotiating fairly with any municipal union. And this is what brought us all together, is the frustration. Is the frustration, and now that's bringing us together collectively, and it's turned into a, a, a three-headed monster, and we're gonna make something out of it. So thank you very much for your support. I would also be remiss if I just didn't mention real quickly about some of the people that made this possible, because there's been a, a, a lot of moving parts. Eddie Halloran, right here, he gets his uh, a, a round of applause. Absolutely. 
Without Eddie, without Eddie and his inspiration, there would be no SLC, I can tell you that. Peter Blakey, thank you very much. Mike McGrath, Mike Cabral, Steve Ross, Jimmy Roderick, Terry Medeiros, all the members of the uh, SLC Executive Board, thank you very much for making this happen. And now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our moderator for the night from SCAT TV, the ubiquitous uh, Joe Lynch. Welcome to the 2017 Somerville Labor Coalition Candidates Night and Forum. I am Joe Lynch, your moderator for the evening, and it is my pleasure to have been asked by the SLC to participate in tonight's event. I am a Board of Directors member of the Somerville Media Center, more commonly known to most of you as SCAT TV, and we are thrilled to be asked by SLC to tape tonight's forum, but before we go any further, we played a trick on all of you. We are Facebook living this event. So when Eddie and Tommy asked me, they said, should we announce it? I said, no, because they'll all stay home. So it is on the Somerville Labor Coalition's live face be, uh, Facebook feed as we speak. So, SCAT TV will be showing this tape program in the coming days. Watch for announcements in the local media and on SCAT TV's website. In the interest of full disclosure, though, I do have to reveal that I'm also the vice chair of the Ward 5 City Democratic Committee. So, let's get down to the business of tonight. As with any political forum or debate, there are some guidelines and rules that the SLC and I have agreed to follow and the candidates. First and foremost, in the event of any emergency, please take a look around the room, familiarize yourself with the emergency exits of the facility and the moderator is taken out first. <laughs> Second, we ask that all recording devices, cameras and cell phones be put on mute and that flashes to be, are held to a minimum. And third, Please get very comfortable because it's going to be a very long night. I would like to recognize, as Tommy has, the planners of tonight's event. So if the leaders of the SLC could stand and be acknowledged one more time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Also in the room, but not participating, are some of the current elected officials here in Somerville. So I'm just gonna ask you to hold your applause. State Representative Denise Provo is here. <laughs> not participating. So we also have uh, Ward 1 Alderman, Matt McLaughlin. He's already standing, all right. Let me see, we also have Ward 5 Alderman Mark Niedegang, Ward 6 Alderman Lance Davis. We have from the Somerville School Department, we have Ward 5 and Chair of the Somerville School Committee, Laura Patone. We also have Carrie Norman, who is in attendance. We have Lee Erica Palmer in attendance. Did I miss anybody? Any current elected official? Sorry? They are participating tonight. They get their own special introduction. <laughs> Union folks, pay attention. <laughs> I'd also like to, re I, I would like to recognize somebody who all of the candidates know, whether they're gonna be up here uh, debating or chatting. We have the special pleasure of having one of the best election commissioners in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Where is Nick Salerno? Where is he? Get up. Get up, Salerno. So thank you all for coming. We also have with us declared candidates for school committee from Ward 1. As you know, the school committee will be contacted by SLC at a later point. So the school committee candidates for Ward 1 are Guillermo Samuel Hamlin. He's with us tonight. Tracy Pratt is here with us tonight and Emily Ackman. In Ward 2, we have two new entrants into the Ward 2 school committee. We have Ann Kamara 
And we have Susan McDonald Neonakis. We also have in Ward 1 a new entrant. Elio LaRusso is present in the room. Elio, down the back. And I think I got everybody there. So let me just kind of, uh, th there was some confusion about who's participating and who's not participating. So as it was explained in the emails sent out by the SLC, we also have the late entrants who will not be participating in tonight. So there was a cutoff that was established by the SLC when they sent out their questionnaire. If, they re if the candidates returned their questionnaire, then they were included for endorsement by the SLC and they would be invited to the forum. So that's how it worked. The late entrants did not get invited to participate in the forum. They will also not be considered for endorsement by the SLC. So let's get going. The forum will be broken into three different segments. First up will be the candidates for the individual wards. The eligible participants will be from Ward 2, Ward 3, and Ward 4. Next will be the two declared candidates for mayor. And we will finish up with the evening with the seven eligible candidates for four aldermen at large seats. One candidate informed the SLC this morning, late this morning, early this afternoon, that he would not be participating in the forum. We do have some questions from the audience, and if time allows, we will make every effort to include them in the candidate questions. We're on a very, very tight timetable, and I know everyone is very excited to see the candidate do well, but in order to give the maximum time for the answers, we ask all of you to hold any applause or cheering or audible displeasure till the very end of the round. If not, I will have Mayor Jean Brune take you out into the lobby and talk to you. <laughs> and talk to you for a very long time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to begin and welcome the Ward 4 candidates, two challengers, Jesse Klingen and Omar Bukili. As with all of our candidates tonight, a two-minute opening statement. And let's go alphabetically. Okay with you? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? There you go. Oh, Hi. Omar Bukili, two-minute opening statement. Hi, everybody. My name is Omar Bukili. Um, I'm running for Ward 4 Alderman. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces um, here. Um, I was born and raised in, in Morocco, and I moved to the area via, uh, or by way of California and DC um, about a decade ago. Um, and I am running because I want to make sure that everybody gets a voice uh, in our political process, and I mean everybody, uh, not just a squeaky wheel, even the folks who feel intimidated by uh, government, being local, be it local or, or state or federal. Uh, when I moved to the country, I had to uh, interact with an entity that seemed to be huge and, and all powerful and could take you away in a heartbeat. Um, and I got into a public service in order to change that attitude, that perception, and change the way these governments uh, interact with the people they're supposed to serve. Um, what I would provide is always honesty. I'm extremely straightforward. Uh, what you see is what you get. Um, I have uh, experience in municipal government. Uh, I am the point person for the city of Revere when it comes to collective bargaining. Uh, and I am value oriented. I, I believe in the stuff I work for and I'm extremely relentless uh, when it comes to pursuing those issues. Um, and I look forward to a spirited campaign. I think it's gonna be um, a hell of a time. Uh, and um, thank you for, um, for the time. Thank you, Omar. Jesse Klingen, Ward 4 candidate. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, brothers and sisters. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to be here. It's both my honor and my pleasure. My name is Jesse Kling, and I'm running for Ward 4 Alderman. I am a proud union member. I am a, I am a member of the National Association of Government Employees, Local 292. And uh, I just want to say thanks again. I, uh, so first off, I, I grew up in Selma. I was born and raised here. Um, I, uh, matter of fact, in, in the ward, I'm, I'm now knocking doors on, and so it's, it's such a pleasure to be back. Um, I, I, I lived in seven different apartments growing up in Sunwell. My mother was a single mother. She worked for Cass Head Start. She worked for the Sunwell Homeless Coalition. Um, after, so to be back in Sunwell now, I had been priced out in 2002. Um, it's just been amazing. And, and, but even when I wasn't living in Sunwell, I was extremely active in the community. So I'm just, I'm just happy to be back. And what I want to say is that you know, I, I had been in the service industry for many years, uh, the, the restaurant, hotel, and uh, luxury uh, transportation industry. And I, I've actually been the victim of wage theft. I've been the victim of um, bad labor practices and uh, tyrannical bosses. And it wasn't until I joined the union myself that I, I really began to appreciate the, the uh, collective bargaining process, and having union representation. Um, the unions allowed, uh, afforded me to be able to provide for my family without having to get on my knees and beg management for a raise. Okay, we shouldn't have, united we bargain, divided we beg is something I live by. And people that know me, they know that I don't cross picket lines, I walk them. I've, I've adopted picket lines for Verizon. When they went on strike, I've adopted picket lines for the local 26 dining workers. And, uh, and, and I am proud to say so far I have 12, 12 union endorsements, including that of the Somerville Employees, uh, Somerville Employees Association, uh, Somerville Municipal Employees Association. Um, and so, you know, with that said, again, I thank you and uh, I, I look forward to building a strong campaign in Ward 4. I've been out talking to many uh, union members already and it's amazing how many connections I have in that ward and how many uh, uh, union members there are in that ward. So, so I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Let's go to a subject that we haven't covered all that well, civil service. Do you support civil service process for hiring and promotions? Omar. I actually support a hybrid system between civil service and assessment center. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from uh, public safety uh, employees uh, who are subject to uh, civil service who do not have the time to study for their tests uh, because of their assignments, because of their um, uh, family situation. Um, I believe in something that we can sit down with every bargaining unit uh, and hammer out some kind of structure that would allow us to take into account uh, somebody's civil service score and add other attributes to it or other um, issues to, um, to uh, test or evaluate. I think that's the fairest way to do it. I think it allows for uh, upward mobility and I think it would provide for folks who do not have the ability to study properly for those tests to also have the opportunity for advancement. Thank you, Omar. Um, second question. Yeah, sure. Which one did I read? Civil service. Yeah. Do you support civil service process for hiring and promotions? Yes, I absolutely support civil service. Um, that needs to be kept in place, otherwise it allows for patronage and um, you know, uh, it gives too much power to administrations to be able to put in and, and replace whoever they want. So I, I agree with going with the civil service system. As most of you know, as most of you know, uh, the mayor, the current mayor, uh, with the support of the, board, the then Board of Aldermen, removed the Somerville police chief from the civil service process. Would you support removing the chief of the fire department from civil service, Omar? Um, again, it's the, the exact same answer. Uh, I'm not saying remove it entirely. I'm talking about a hybrid system that would allow everybody, um, not just based on the, uh, a score that somebody has scored uh, in one test, um, to be able to have a shot at advancement. I'd like to see something that would also reward somebody who's hungry, who's ambitious, but doesn't have the time to study properly for those tests. And for those of you who took them, they're not straightforward. They can be extremely convoluted if you haven't taken the time to study. 
Thank you, Omar. Um, before we go to the next question, I've been asked by SLC to remind the members that if you have to leave, please turn in your scorecards before you leave. And my fly is not down, Tommy Ross. <laughs> Jesus. A, li a little levity? <laughs> Gentlemen, let's go in. I'm sorry, Jesse Klingen, your response. Um, unequivocally support um, keeping civil service for the fire chief in place. Uh, it's worked f for however many years. I think uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I think we should keep that in place. Thank you. Holy applause, please. Let's go into privatization. Would you support bringing back those outsourced jobs that were previously outsourced under claimed financial difficulties but could be brought back now because the city appears to be in much better fiscal shape? Uh, I'd, I'd be supportive of bringing back whatever we can bring back. Yes. Um, I also want to make sure that we don't, when you say privatization, um, it, it seems to have a bad connotation 100% of the time. I know outfits that are private who are also 100% union. Um, so, but if we have the ability to bring back those jobs, I think that the services are better delivered by folks from the inside, yes. I think specifically what they're asking, let me just do a follow up because there are two questions about it. Would you support the restoration of city workers to the high school and the Winter Hill School? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Omar. Jesse? Uh, yes, I would support bringing back those positions as union positions. Um, I am 1,000% against privatization in any case. I believe in a unionized workforce. I think that uh, when, when we do privatize, it never uh, benefits anybody. The quality of worker goes down, and we never end up saving. I see it all over the place with privatization where, you know, it, it, the, the cost is, it, it, it's not up, you don't see it in, in, out front, but in the back, it comes back as it's definitely ends up costing the taxpayer a lot more money. I'd rather see a strong unionized workforce than some of them. Thank you. Let's go back into another question, and this is about the mayor's board appointments. Recently, the planning board allowed Federal Realty Investment Trust to decrease its affordable units from the proposed inclusionary zoning of 20% down to just 6% in lieu of a housing trust fund payment. Would you as aldermen use your power to deny mayoral appointees and be more selective in this appointment process? Let's start with Omar. Well, I, I would exercise uh, the rights and the purview that the board has. Uh, if I don't deem a candidate to be qualified and a, uh, somebody who should be on that board, uh, then I wouldn't vote for that person. I'll say? Yes. Just. Uh, yeah, so, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the answer is no. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely uh, not approve those, those people. And uh, I think what we really, what we really need, to, need to be talking about here, though, is independence. And I am somebody who's an independent voice. Um, I, I take answers from nobody. I, I take uh, orders from nobody except myself. And um, I think it's just important that we start to um, uh, get the right people on the board of aldermen who, who can actually um, make independent change. Thank you, Jess. Once again, at the uh, discretion of SLC, I can ask a follow-up question that was not part of the questions here. Many of the demands have not been met through federal, realty, uh, federal realty's promises that were made, including using union labor down at Assembly Row. Would you support an ordinance in this city that demanded union labor for folks like Federal Realty, a private company, or folks like Somerville Community Corporation, a not-for-profit. Let's start with Jesse. Um, Want me to rephrase it? Just a I just missed the last part. No. We have for-profit companies and not-for-profit companies building yeah. in this city. So, yeah, so I don't, it, to me, um, no matter who's building, as long as they're using union labor, that's, uh, that's fine with me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I am 100% of the time for union labor on all projects. Um, I think what happened in assembly was despicable with Callahan. And uh, you know, shame on uh, uh, Federal Realty for, for, for not using union labor on that project. 
Just let me do a follow-up. Would you say shame on SCC for not using union labor at Washington Street? Yes, I would. Thank you. Absolutely. Omar? Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I had the chance to uh, do a few things in, in my uh, career in government. I have a track record of positive change. Everybody can, can take a look at it, um, especially in my last year and a half in the city of Riviere. Um, the conceptually, yes. Um, the best way to uh, make sure that everybody has the ability to live with dignity is to make sure that they have good jobs, uh, construction jobs, service industry jobs. Uh, I would absolutely support the concept. Now, the issue may be that the ordinance may not be legally sound, and that's the type of issues that the Board of Aldermen deals with all the time. Uh, you can have a great idea, uh, it may sound good, but then you get into the nitty gritty, and that's exactly what I do, the mechanics of everything, and realize that it's something that cannot be done under current law, the law has to change, or can't be done under federal law at all. Uh, there was an example a few years ago when a uh, local hiring ordinance was proposed. Um, it was not legal, so the Board of Aldermen could not pass it. Uh, conceptually, however, every um, entity that tries to do or wants to do business in the city should make sure that they're paying their employees a good wage, that they allow them the ability to live with dignity and put food on, on, on their table. Thank you, Omar. Let's move on to collective bargaining. Would you use the moral authority of your office to assist public and private sector unions in our community to settle their collective bargaining disputes? And how would you go about doing that? Let's go to Jesse. Uh, yeah, I would do everything in my power as alderman to, uh, to, to assist in, 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 in seeing through these negotiations. I think it's uh, one of the ways I would do is just is, um, you know, getting people to the table, speaking to the to the uh, actual employees, and seeing what the needs are, and uh, trying to help them meet their needs through through uh, th through negotiations. Thank you, Jess. Omar. Um, I absolutely would. Yes, uh, and I think the best tool that um, an alderman, or elected official, has is to facilitate conversation between different parties. I think that cooler heads have to prevail all the time. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then the only person or the only people that get hurt are people who are providing these services. So I would do my best, just like I'm doing today in Revere, to make sure that that happens. Uh, and to give you an example, in the last 11 months, uh, I'm the per point person for, the, um, for Mayor Rigo and Revere for collective bargaining. We have settled six different collective bargaining agreements with one left, one in the works, in less than 12 months, without staff, with very minimal legal um, uh, assistance. So um, I can promise you that if there is a way, I will find it. Thank you, Omar. Are we pretty much wrapping up this 20 minutes. portion? 20 minutes. 20 minutes is up. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your candidates for Ward 4, Jesse Klinger and Omar Bukwili. Thank you so much. One, it is my pleasure to introduce to you two first-time candidates for mayor of the city of Somerville. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Ken Van Buskirk and Peyton Corbett. Come on up, gentlemen. How are you, Ken? And we're gonna go right to two minute opening statements. Let's go to Peyton Corbett. All right, good evening, SLC members. It's uh, my honor and uh, a privilege to speak uh, before you tonight. So my name is Peyton Corbett, and I am running for mayor here in Somerville. <laughs> a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I didn't grow up here. You can probably tell by the way I speak. Uh, but I've been here for about 14 years. Uh, I'm a, an elected official with Teamsters Local 122, where I serve as a trustee on the executive board. I'm also a shop steward in my workplace, where I've worked for 14 years, and a union and community activist. Uh, I learned pretty early on, uh, through my experiences in the labor movement, the power that regular, ordinary working people have when we stand together and we use our collective voice to fight for justice. I became a Teamster when I was 20 years old. I got a job driving a beer truck before I was even old enough to enjoy the goods I was carrying around. 
<laughs> you know, another thing I've learned through my experience in the labor movement is to take, to take those shop floor politics that we learn in the union, right? We stand up for everybody. No matter if we have difference with, differences with them, when we're on the shop floor, there are brothers and there are sisters. And that's how I see politics. You know, there was a time in this country when union members would go out into their communities and they would, they would work together, they would run for local office, they would, they would fight to elect the right politicians. And we've, got, we've gotten away from that. And I am here to bring that back. Somebody said it earlier, they said, we claim to be this progressive city, right? We claim to have progressive leaders here, or a progressive leader, who is not here. Think about that. He's down the street at a fundraiser. So we claim to have these progressive leaders, but is union busting a, a progressive value? Is privatization a progressive value, right? Look, we can fly every flag there is, and we can hang banners on every building in this city, but none of it means a damn if people can't afford to live here. Thank you very much. Ken, two-minute opening statement. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Kenneth Van Boskirk. I'm a, a resident of Ward 3. Um, I've lived in the city for 12 years, and... Um, uh, in 2013, I was a campaign co-chair for the Progressive Democrats, and we added three new uh, Board of Aldermen members that year in those elections. And I felt at that time that this would, um, that this would uh, bring us change in the city. Um, it has not done that. The bottom-up approach has not worked. Um, everyone is talking about how the mayor, you know, he's been unopposed for 10 years. He has. He, he doesn't run the city democratically, and I was shocked to go up to City Hall and, and, and at one of the Board of Aldermen's meetings to see that uh, they're voting on an evergreen clause, and after the meeting, finding out that he, the mayor has a terrible relationship with our unions, which should not be. Uh, I, I, got a, I pulled papers and got on the ballot because I want to change that. It's not going to come from the bottom up. The, we need a new mayor, and that's why I have taken the step. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So I'm going to stay on that for a bit, and once again, it is a question that I want answered. Do you think that the current strong mayoral form of government is good or bad for Somerville? That's an extremely tough question. Uh, I talk to folks in Cambridge where they have a different system, and you know, there's problems with that system as well. I think we do need some charter reform in this city. I still think maybe, you know, you have to have somebody that's accountable. Uh, I, we, we do need some charter reform. So I think a point maybe moving some powers to the Board of Aldermen, which brings power back to the people in the wards, is the way to go. Um, I, don't have all the, I don't have all the answers. I would, I would have to meet with, you know, legal departments and find out what our options are. If there, if there are hybrid systems, I believe uh, the city of Sh Chicago has a little, the aldermen there have a bit more power. Thank you. Ken? Uh, I, I'm not well versed on the technical aspects of that, but I, I am aware that, uh, that the mayor has um, a lot of powers and he uses those powers in ways that I don't agree with. And um, I, I have worked on elections, I, I've worked um, on campaigns, and that's where I'm coming from. And what I think is the quick solution is get a new mayor. Let's have an election. Let's get him out. That's what I want. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really like having a strong mayor. I think it's undemocratic. The other cities seem to have a better arrangement. But we really need change quickly. And I, I would like to reform that. I, I don't know exactly how to do it, because I've never focused on policy. I've always focused on elections. And that's why I'm here, and that's what I would push for, because I think we have the momentum to get a new mayor, and I think we should run with that. Let's stay with it for a minute. You stay with the powers that the mayor does have. So the mayor selects some appointments. Some of the more powerful boards in this city are the Planning Board, the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Licensing Commission, and the like. 
So recently, the planning board allowed FRIT to decrease its affordable housing units from the proposed inclusion area of 20% down to 6%, and then gave somebody a bunch of money in the housing trust fund. How would you, if you were elected mayor, how would you have handled that situation when you have a very powerful developer like Frit coming to you and saying, either you give us less or we walk? Why don't we start with you, Ken? Um, I, I'm not, once again, I'm not really well versed in policy, so I hope, you, hope you'll forgive me for that. But uh, um, probably don't really have a great idea of how to, how to handle that, but um, uh, I think that, you know, considering that the, the, the mayor has a lot of control and they want to do business in our city, you know, exercise some pressure on them. Get them, you know, to realize that, you know, we're, we're not going to give up adding affordable units. We need it. We need every little, you know, every bit of affordable housing we can grab. They can't reduce that. We have to insist on it. Thank you, Ken. Peyton. Uh, well, I'm very familiar with the, the Fritz situation in Assembly Square. I was uh, entrenched as an activist in that fight. And uh, actually, I have quite a famous sign that some people here might have seen uh, highlighting several of the political donations from Federal Realty employees, their family members, lobbyists, to, uh, to, to our mayor. So, you know, if, as mayor, I think that it's your duty to stand with the people, to stand with, to, to stand with the people that live in the city, not the people that necessarily do business with the city. He had the opportunity to take a stand, and he decided to stand with Frit. He said he was neutral, and then his representative got up in front of the board of aldermen, said he was neutral, and then basically gave a commercial for how great Frit is. And, you know, in my eyes, that's not right. Thank you, Peyton. Let's go into uh, let's go into one question that I haven't asked yet, and it's about the evergreen clauses in contracts. Would you follow up on any resolutions you vote in favor of, such as the most recent unanimous resolution passed by the current Board of Aldermen on evergreen clauses, and would you take the lead as mayor to change the policies on negotiations of an evergreen clause. As mayor, I, um, I, I would uh, want to be a very pro-labor mayor. I think that as Democrats, we, um, we need to stand by organized labor. We need to stand by our public employees. Um, and uh, um, I, would, um, I would make sure that, that we develop a, a harmonious relationship with our unions, restore one, uh, if we ever had one. I think probably long ago before this mayor, maybe we had a harmonious relationship with our unions. Um, we don't have one now. We have, basically I have a, a dictator in, in the corner office who, uh, who's gonna t you know, tell people what to do and deny people their wages and benefits. And he's done that for seven years. Thank you, Ken. Peyton? Well, I'm a teamster, so how do you guys think I'm gonna answer that question? <laughs> but let me just say this. The Teamsters are a very diverse union. My local in particular is both private sector and public sector. Half of my members work in the public sector, many in uh, public housing in cities in, in Boston and a lot of cities surrounding here. And I don't have to tell you folks that public sector employees are treated differently than private sector. Nine times out of 10, you folks don't have the opportunity to strike. So you need those evergreen clauses more than anybody else. And to think, that anybody with a D after their name would want to get rid of evergreen clauses is just despicable in my eyes. Thank you, Peyton. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do one follow-up question. If either of you are successful in your bid, can you make a pledge to every single person in this room about your evergreen clause stance? Absolutely. <laughs> Elaborate if you wish. Yep. Look, there's plenty of money in this city. There are plenty of people making money in this city. There are developers making money hand over fist. There are departments at City Hall. Look, as a trade unionist, I never want to see anyone lose their job, but no union member is ever going to lose their job under my watch. 
and there's money. There's money. There's money where we can get it. Have you guys seen the budget for the communications department? <laughs> do, do, we, do we need a PR and marketing firm to tell us how great Somerville is? People are fighting to get in here. Ken? Att it was my attendance at the Board of Aldermen's meeting where the uh, Evergreen uh, Clause vote took place and speaking with the union leaders after that meeting um, that prompted me to start thinking about pulling papers and running for mayor. That became my, the last straw for me. I know that the mayor, his policies, uh, he has a long string of bad policies, bad for the residents, bad for the workers, the city workers. I recognize since 2013, after going to more meetings, how hard our city workers actually work for us. And without receiving a pay increase in seven years or an increase in benefits, they have worked as if they had that. That's, and when I go out canvassing you know, for signatures, people tell me, oh, I, I'm happy with the mayor. He, he runs city government so efficiently. And like I'm thinking, he doesn't run it. The employees run it. They need, deserve the credit. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to ask you a question I asked before about health care benefits. Somerville has sought to balance its budget by shifting health care costs on the backs of the city employees and retirees. If you are successful, how are you going to balance the budget without touching the benefits? Let's start with Peyton. Well, again, you know, some top heavy departments in City Hall, uh, there's plenty of money to be moved from departments that have way too many employees, making, making non-union employees making way, way too much money. As, you know, as, as, others, as others have talked about possible, uh, you know, land transfer taxes. Look, there is plenty of money to be made in this city and it's not off the backs of workers. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Peyton. Ken? On this issue, I think that uh, we, do, we don't have a, like a spending problem. We have a revenue problem in the city. And um, I take a look at Tufts University. They pay $200,000 a year for their city services. And they buy up properties, income producing properties in our city. And they make money off of us. And they don't pay anything back, really. They're, and they're a billion dollar institution. Why should they get a free ride? I think it's time to, to get them to pay a, a, a fair value for the, the services they're getting from our city. Um, and we could raise additional revenue there. And um, the same with large corporations that do business within our city limits. They're not being required to, uh, to pay their fair share of taxes. Um, those sources for, re for revenue, I would have a look at. I would push to, to, uh, to make those institutions pay. Because we, c we can't go on like this, forcing property owners to, you know, to pay exorbitant uh, property taxes that force them out of the city. Thank you, Ken. I'm gonna do a follow-up on that out of the back of my brain. One of you, should either of you be successful? You're now sitting in the mayor's office. Big developer from Union Square comes in and says, give me what I want or I'm gonna walk. What do you tell that developer? See you later. <laughs> Look, it's as simple as that. There's a, there's a whole lot of people that want to make money in this city. They're lining up. We don't need them, they need us. We want developers who are good partners, not parasites. Look, if we're gonna take land by eminent domain and we're gonna sell it at under market value to developers, for, to for-profit developers, no way. If we're going to take land by eminent domain, then it's going to be for the good of the public. And I don't want 20% affordable housing. I want commercial on the bottom with 100% affordable housing above it. Thank you, Peyton. Ken, you're the mayor of Somerville. Somebody from one of the many developers from Union Square and walks in and says, give me 10% affordable housing or I'll walk. What do you say to them? 
Okay, um, I, I will never take any money from a developer um, in this campaign, and I will never be influenced by their decisions. I, I know how the current mayor operates. He takes huge amounts of money from other politicians do too. I would never do that. Um, we, we need to give our, our, our residents a voice in the process. We need to do the will of the people, and um, we're a prime location. Everyone wants to, seems to want to do business in Somerville now. We don't have, we're not desperate. The mayor is not desperate either. He, he has gotten huge amounts of campaign contributions from those people. That's why he says yes. And I, I say no to them. Thank you, Ken. 20 minutes goes fast when you're having fun up here, gentlemen. I got one more question for you. You're successful, you've become mayor. But over the last several years, the SMEA and the police have filed more than 100 charges with the Department of Labor against the city for violations of their contract. Let me ask you a question just off the top of my head. Do you think these, these grievances, you think they're just a bunch of crybabies or do we have a mayor who is violating those contracts? We, it's pretty clear, even from long-term aldermen who have spoken here, the mayor is a union buster. He is not friendly when it comes to working people in this city. Yeah. Look, I, as, a, as a shop steward and as a union official, I represent workers all the time. And yeah, are there times then that someone files a grievance that I'm like, uh, I don't know, that's more of a gripe than a grievance. And I don't think, I don't think someone like Ed O'Halloran is gonna put forth a grievance that he doesn't believe in. Thank you, Peyton. Ken? Eddie, Eddie, you can take your bows later. It's their turn. Okay, I, I look at this mayor and he has a law degree. He's been a lawyer, he's been a real estate lawyer. And he knows the system, he knows it inside and out. And he knows what he can get away with. And, and the term, for him is obstructionist. Um, and that's what he's doing. He knows what he can get away with. It, this boils down to policy. This election, I think, will be about policy. We need to change the policies. And um, this mayor, I don't think he'll ever give the unions what they want. I, I don't think he's ever gonna even negotiate during this, um, this election season. He, he, he's not gonna do it. He's not gonna let go of all, all, you know, all, um, all that money for wages and benefits that he hasn't paid in seven years. I just don't see him doing it. Um, so we, we need a new mayor. We, we need to solve this question politically. We don't, it's not going to be solved through the courts because he, he's an expert at, at getting around the court system. So thank, thank you, Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, these are two challengers for mayor in the city of Somerville.